The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Just so you know, Dave, I actually haven't had caffeine yet in medical school. And I, I know. That you're... streak is going strong, and I'm really kind of happy with it. But is there I... a reason... I don't care for I feel how like it you're makes coming me at feel. me. <laughs> like, yeah, I, my, you're not. <laughs> my immediate like reaction to that was like, we get it. You're better than the rest of us. Like, fine. And like, that is not how you intended it. I don't but think like, so. I, I, that was my reception of that. No, I think I'm projecting. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what's the reason? I don't like how it makes me feel. Fair. Physically or mentally? Both, yeah. I guess. Yeah, it's I like have a, a hard time separating the physical and the mental. Probably if, been in medical school. If you school think about long. it hard enough, yeah. it's hard to, to I separate blame, them. In I general. blame Sipla for this, but yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess both. But I mean, to be fair, I also don't have a problem. Like I was up at three thirty this morning, and I didn't plan to be, but I woke up and I thought, well, okay, let's start our day, and here we are. You know, so. I woke up at three thirty, four thirty, five thirty, and six thirty this morning. So see, that's that may be one of my biggest differences is I don't I don't try to go back to sleep. I'm just like, well, here we go. Let's start our day. What if do you I wake up to do? If I wake time. up at four a.m., anytime after four a.m., I'll probably be fine. If it's three fifty nine, I will be sad. Okay, I have follow up <laughs> questions. What are we doing? What are we doing at four a.m.? Sometimes I read, Reading. sometimes I write. That sounds um, lovely. I have an acoustic guitar and I've learned all of the songs from Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Okay. And some <laughs> spooky songs for Halloween for some friends of mine. Mm, there um, you go. My my housemates were upset last night because I was playing Walking in a Winter Wonderland. And they yeah, that's they, annoying, they wouldn't take Jeff. it. Come on. No, I love no. it. Come on. I'm all come for on, it. Jeff. Wait, it's so not even Thanksgiving. That's yeah, that's multiple ho- holidays too early. So you have to be prepared. <laughs> yes, to practice. That's true. Really? That's true. I'm you a Halloween hater, you, so you can't I'm just start. all for it. It's okay. Why do I hate Halloween? I don't know. It feels like a chore to find a Halloween costume. It does. It feels like a chore. I've been scouring the internet for the last two days trying to figure out how to not spend money on getting a new costume because I just don't care that much. You know and what other chore it is that like other people have opinions. Like yeah. I'm, I'm married and, and I love my spouse, but I'm a silly goose and <laughs> she is just bound and determined for me to do something that's a little bit more, has a little bit more sex appeal. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, babe, silly goose. Silly goose. I'm, I'm a silly goose. You know? See, I feel so, like there's oh, not wait a minute, enough. Go ahead. Follow up. Mm, not going to let that one go by. <laughs> for your wife, what would be the sex the, the sexy costume that Jeff would wear? She is a fan of a show called Oh shoot. I forgot the name of it. It's a Taiko Watiti show. Our flag means death. Oh right. Yeah. So great it, show. It, yeah. And um between that and what we do in the shadows, these Taiko Watiti vibes of like serious topics mm. done goofy. Mm-hmm. And uh so she wanted me to be either like a sexy vampire kind of vibe or like a sexy pirate kind of vibe. And um, I hate to admit this to the world, but I'm actually going to do Laszlo from what we do in the shadows because mm. he's enough of a silly goose that I think like I <laughs> can, can tolerate trying two. to be sexy. OK, OK. That's my t- entire beef, though, with Halloween costumes is I scour the Internet and every option is like be a sexy snowman. And I'm like, I'm past the age of sexy snowman. I have a manatee onesie you could borrow. <clears throat> but I mean. Counter to counter, I, did not get I for need Halloween. it in I just, like four hours. So I, could, I live, I live a five minute walk from here, my friend. No, I can bring I'm you probably going to be Kim Possible. That's it works. That's Solid. even better. Thanks, Solid guys. That's costume. perfect. Thanks, everyone. So. Meandering in the margins of medicine. It's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Shortcode Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio, a lovely group. Of medical students. Uh, say hello to MD, PhD student Riley B. and Bush. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back, MD, PhD student Faith Prohaska. Howdy. Thanks for coming, M2 Jeff Goddard. Hello. And hello there to you, MD, PhD student Jacqueline Nielsen. Hello. Before we begin, I, I need to crowdsource some opinions here. I work in an office, and sometimes there are snacks in the kitchen area. And the other, yesterday I was feeling peckish in the afternoon 
And I went to the kitchen to see what was up. And I saw that there was only a bag of Italian seasoned croutons. <laughs> if you were me, would you go for it? Yeah. <laughs> in faith. I, I have a bag of croutons like in my like snack bin currently in my apartment. Okay. That I have been snacking on. I, I mean, I felt guilty. I felt a little strange about it because they're not really meant to be. They're, they're say, meant well, to be an, your, an, an doing ingredient. Doing it out of the bag. What was that's your hesitation? Weird, but like, it, 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 this, croutons are meant to be an ingredient. I mean, you're sort of a feral, you know. <laughs> I'm You're sort of going feral. feral if you're scooping Italian seasoned croutons in your mouth rather than. But then, you know, counterpoint. What's the difference between that and like a cracker or a chip See, or whatever? They're all carbs. With, it's yeah. really not that different than okay. than other snack foods. The other problem is, I mean, I did go for it. Okay. And now uh, that you have approbation, you're like, I mean, yeah, I, was, I wasn't was going to, I wasn't going to say. Was this and it was hunger quite satis- motivated, or was this just like tasty food? Oh, desire? Taste, tasty food desire okay. motivated. I mean, cool. I was not starving for okay. sure. Um, <laughs> But then the other problem is, you know, you stick a crouton in your mouth and you start chewing it and you feel like the entire office can hear you chewing on your crouton. This was my fear when I was in kindergarten. This we could psychoanalyze this. But when I remember like one of my first fears of like people, I remember thinking everyone can hear me chew. I am chewing so loud. Nobody else is chewing this loud. Mm -hmm. I didn't put the pieces together that like. Everyone else is also chewing. Sure. And I don't hear them. And they therefore, right. I am probably not chewing. Well, this loud. is this is the classic like we think people are paying more attention to us yeah. than they are when really they're inside their own heads paying attention to themselves. I learned and we're this all lesson thinking, at right. six. Well, I didn't learn the lesson. I went down the hole and now I've been reworking that lesson for sure. many years of my life. But croutons are probably pretty loud, though. Is um, your is I mean, your mouth OK? Like when it was I eat a little. Croutons, it, yeah, it, it was a little. It up. Uh, yeah. A little torn up. Interestingly enough, but not enough to make me regret it (laughs) in fourth grade. I got detention because I couldn't quite comprehend that people could hear the things going on in my mouth. It didn't (laughs) make sense to me. I was just making funny noises, but my mouth was close. How can they hear me? Yeah, this is inside of my skull. Yeah, how you were like you were like doing like very because if you learn enough that chewing is not that loud. Then yeah. you would immediately think, oh, well, like me making sounds is not. That. Yeah, can you give me? Can you give me an example? What was? What were the? What was it like? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, no, Fair. I would have rioted Legit- as a fourth <laughs> grader if I was anywhere near not, you. I I did not comprehend like how is he hearing this? Yeah. And so I kept doing it mostly because like I was it was a science experiment. Like there's no way. How does he know? And well, it turns out it's quite loud outside of my head too. My bad. There are so many moments of like me as a child and I look back at them and I was like, that was wacky. Like I got in trouble from basically what I did is I, did you guys ever draw little like tornadoes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like where you just do the swiggle and yeah. you like make it smaller mm-hmm. as you go down. Yeah, yeah. Well, I probably do like 20 of these in my margin of my paper one day. I was probably bored. This was kindergarten. My parents had to come in and have a meeting okay, with no. my teacher for me Squiggling these little tornadoes. What was the objection to this? Kindergarten? I was just like, I was just like doodling. What was the objection? I don't to know. And honestly, the older I get, the more I wonder if I'm really truly remembering this correctly. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I have this like ingrained memory of me sitting there with my parents, the teachers like sliding over the paper in which there are twenty tornadoes drawn all around the margins, and me just having to be like. Oh, no. If I, I was think a parent, what actually if, happened is she didn't actually do anything else on the paper. It's just 23 <laughs> tornadoes and a blank paper. I'd be willing to believe that. But like, maybe I'm coming at it with the attitude of, like, I had half-day kindergarten, so, like, okay. they had yeah, oh, yeah, that's other right. things yeah. to deal with. Like, Queen Deb had, like, twice as many children as every other teacher. <laughs> like, she was great. She was perfect. Love her so much. But, like, she had a bunch of kindergartners, half, and then she would go to lunch, and then they would switch out. So, like, oh. she had other things to be dealing yeah. with. Yeah, I don't even remember if this was actually a problem, but... It's all right. It's my, my, my daughter used to habitually scat like a jazz man. <laughs> and so... You that know, is incredibly endearing, I unless mean, you have 20 other kids to take care of. So, the, the, <laughs> during a conf- parent-teacher conference, the, uh, the teacher was like, does, your, does, does, does she... Does she, is she a jazz man? (laughs) (laughs) There's something so funny about this to me. (laughs) Loved it. And my my, single handedly made me want to have children. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It was, that's that's all it took. That's all it took. (laughs) What if I get a scatter? It'll all be worth it. (laughs) I've been on the edge for so long. That's it. She was on a Scatman John kick at the time. So I think she was just like singing it out loud, you know? Anyway. All right. So I'm not going to feel so bad. I don't know how we got 
to hear, but I'm not going to feel so bad about my crouton, my love of croutons. Thank you very much. Feel good about that. You just need to go across the hall to Osak. Yeah. Say hi to Audra. No, no, I know. They stay so- But I also stock. feel a little bad about taking the snacks that are... There are people who... It doesn't stop me. ...survive off of those snacks. I know. So I know. I've seen somebody that's walk I in, say hi to Audra, and grab like five different things and then leave. And I was like, that's, you're great. I was like, I honestly respect more that you can like not feel compelled to have a conversation with Audra because she's just the most like lovely human ever that I want to sit there and like tell her about everything. And See, then Audra she's is like, not a perk I had in my first. No, no, yeah. I feel, I feel she, gets, she gets a lot of shouts out on the show yeah. for her snacks. So I, this might, uh, I, you can cut this out, but sure. I, I need to let you know that there is a counter argument to your crouton goblinry. Okay. No. Faith, Faith is right. I don't need to let you know. Uh, <laughs> We just did a lot of mood disorders and I was like really uncomfortable with some traits that I was like, yeah, that's okay. That, that sound sounds familiar. Yeah. A little too much. That said, I can't eat just croutons and it's not the crunch. I'm a huge fan of the texture. Yeah. 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 It is the sodium usually. Oh, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I can't Fair. do anything that's heavily seasoned. But I like salt. Because it, it just makes me nauseous, especially oh. salt. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I can't eat it on its own. I can't even honestly eat it in most foods. Okay. I eat very... My, I have family from Guatemala, and we tend to be very bland in our food, and I like it. I like yeah. just black beans. Well, it's also very compatible with the Midwestern you know, taste, I feel. Well, except for the mm-hmm. whole putting salad on the end of just the most god awful concoctions like, yeah i'm sorry if it has six different times of sour cream it's not a salad yeah that's, yeah. that's not fair hey i want to know you, you tied that with mood disorders and i'm unclear how <laughs> what they were the connection is <laughs> that i have uh, some of those uh, i don't know oh okay yeah. well you have it's some of those traits and that's what's stopping you from eating croutons out of the bag no that's what's stopping me from being able to let it go I, I, see. I have a compulsion to finish thoughts. Okay. Oh, and conversations. Okay. Well, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because maybe this doesn't relate at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you bring this up because we're going a totally different direction. Well, I mean, it, it reminds me of what I wanted to talk about today, which was not what you prepared. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> have you noticed how many people on social media say that they are neurodivergent or have ADHD? Have you noticed this yes. phenomenon? Yeah. Am I? Is it my algorithm? Or no, what? no, it is not. No. Okay, I, it's not that I don't believe them. I, it, it's hard to say whether or not it's common because, like I said, maybe that's just what our algorithm is bringing us. But and you know, so maybe I wouldn't have seen it if I didn't have the interest that I have. But I was watching an example of this. Uh, it's a video entitled "Things you, Entitled Things You Didn't Realize Were Autistic Traits," including. Hating wearing socks, problems with time management, auditory processing difficulties, hating phone calls and rewatching TV shows. And I'm like, all of those things, like maybe, sure. Yeah. But they also kind of describe, several of them kind of describe me as well. I think it gets into like the why, like why you resonate with that. And then like how much of a problem it is. So like mine, there's a lot of those for ADHD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it'll say, like, you, like, do you forget things easily? Or, like, do you lose track of deadlines? And in my head, I'm like, no, I don't. Because everything goes in my planner, in my schedule, or in this. Yes, These are adaptations that you have made. Yeah, it was brought up to me by (laughs) many lovely people in the psych field that I do have a problem with that. But because I have like a management for it. Yeah. It's not currently like posing a problem on my life. Yeah. This is what I've noticed about those online quizzes. Like, you know, do you have ADHD, which I have taken many times because I'm pretty sure that as I've said on the show before, I might be undiagnosed ADHD, but I don't know. But they all seem to be like, well, no, I don't have this problem because I'm 53 and I've figured out some shit. My problem with it is that as somebody who has struggled somewhat and needed some accommodations in my life for various things, I am fully supportive of the concept of neurodiversity. I don't love when it's treated like like a Hogwarts house quiz, you know, when like it's so like in to, to be okay with your neurodivergence that you're, you're looking at it and the symptoms are so vague that it's like a horoscope where it's like, of course, these all apply to everybody that happens to be born at this time. Or of course, these all apply to people that like the color red. I don't know. It's it, yeah. I think the thing that's missing from a lot of these videos um, is the severity thing that you brought up. 
Well, it ultimately has to. I mean, if we if you literally wanted to go get a diagnosis, it has to like play an impact on your life mm-hmm. in these key areas. Yeah. Like, so I grew up with a family where both my younger sisters have had ADHD. One of my sisters has dyslexia. So like it was always kind of in our household. It was like always a big conversation. And you could see like these differences. And I remember like going and talking to my therapist. And I was like, yeah, like I got like a whole family of ADHD, but like, I think I'm fine. And she was like, okay. And then like, there are traits, but the key distinction was like, it wasn't impacting my daily life mm. because I had set up all of these tools and tricks to like, make sure that I was holding on to these But is things. that, okay, that's great. And I think a lot of people do that, but is that, does that mean that you don't have this? And this is a thing Clinically, I've struggled with. Yes, it means yes. that you don't. For me, like I was rocking and rolling totally fine with all of my systems. And then a global pandemic happened and like every system I had built fell apart. Oh, sure. And I did too, yeah. which then was like the part where it became very like, problematic on my life of no I genuinely can't do this like I slowly built up these like these systems over time and like with my parents like helping me from like the time that I was in kindergarten on but like now that I am faced with these problems of my own volition like as an adult like I cannot handle these I cannot redo this by myself without help which is when it becomes a problem so Four months previously, it would not have been clinically significant in order to like warrant a diagnosis, even though I was my same person over the course of those four months. Like, I would say nothing like intrinsically to me changed, but the way that I was functioning and like the way that I was going about things in my life and the impact that like the inside of my brain was having on like the outside of my body was very different. I, th- I think it's relatively positive that people are normalizing some of these things. Mm-hmm. I, th- you know, I think, you know, everybody experiences anxiety. Everybody, you know, experiences some of these traits. And I think that's fine. I worry a little bit that people are over identifying with that. And I'm probably not alone in this concern, but also mm-hmm. like, I- I'm not sure where the line is. And And so my question is, you know, somebody comes to you as a physician and says, hey, I've been watching a lot of TikTok videos and I think I might be autistic or whatever. Do you take that seriously? You know, what do you do with that idea? So you should always take it seriously. If somebody comes to you with a concern, that's just manners, frankly. Like as a good human being, if somebody says, I'm concerned about this, you say, okay, let's work through this together. And then you help them figure out whether or not it's something to be concerned about. That said, I did want to just a little bit of a backpedal in case there are people that don't think that this is a concern. An example from just a few years ago was the Tourette's trend, if you remember this, where teenagers were all over the place developing these tics that were Tourette's-like. And that's not a contagious disease. It doesn't make sense. Why is this happening? And it was linked to TikTok specifically, but other social media as well. It was a social contagion where they were developing these psychosomatic pathologies that were impacting their life in a significant way as teenagers because they were relating to these things, right? The mind is a very powerful force for good or for ill for your body and for your health. So I think that you should always take it seriously, but I think that it, because you take it seriously, you might be able to help convince some of these people that turns out the struggles that they may or may not be having are, if they're real, help them deal with them. And if they're more anxious about being ill than actual illness than helping them find coping mechanisms for that as well. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts Mm -hmm. on this. I mean, especially like I've seen all these videos and kind of like we mentioned, it is these like kind of vague, almost, I don't want to describe it as like horoscope like, like I say horoscope like in the vagueness of Yeah, in that you could see you you could see yourself in a lot of this stuff. And just because you see a video and it's like, oh, I have five of these seven symptoms, like that doesn't necessarily mean that you are that but it also doesn't mean that you don't struggle with a few of those symptoms like for example the idea of like time blindness you don't have to have adhd to be kind of time blind so people that are chronically late often are time blind it's the stereotypical person would be someone that's got two hours to get ready and they know they have two hours to get ready and then they get ready in the last 20 minutes because they kind of just like lost track of all time it's commonly associated with things but it doesn't necessarily mean 
that you have a neurodivergent diagnosis. And so, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that can also be managed by using tools. And I think that's kind of what Jeff was getting at is if somebody comes to you and is like, hey, I think I have this. And then they list the reasons why. Those reasons may be incredibly valid, but it might not mean that they have this like diagnosis. It might not rise to that level where it's clinically. Yes, it's uh, not clinically. Right. And I, I struggle with this because I think sometimes, especially in the case of ADHD, people are going to come and they're going to say, I think I have ADHD. And I think what they possibly could be wanting, I'm generalizing here, is they may be wanting like a medication to help. And it's, it would also be remiss to say that like kind of Adderall and Adderall addiction is not also like a massive problem. So and adults like it's kind of assumed that if you have all of these tendencies, like you must have like a medication that will help you. I'm not saying I'm not I'm not against medication. I think it's super useful for a lot of people. But the problem is it is misdirected and you see it in people that don't necessarily need it. I would also like to just go ahead and burst a common misconception. A lot of people think that if it helps, therefore you have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, mm, I have a lot of friends that work in the airline industry and uh, find a pilot that flies over an ocean that doesn't have an Adderall addiction. Good luck. Okay. I don't want to ever get on a plane now, Josh. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) They want to focus for 15 hours. Good for them. I'm glad that I'm still alive at the end of that 15 hour flight, but my, my, I would my love it if my meds did that for me. Turns like, out drugs like amphetamines are incredibly effective on the human brain, not just people that have maybe a neurodivergent mm-hmm. human brain. So and they also take that with a grain of salt. Work if you differently will. for people who are supposed to be getting prescribed them. Like yeah, they will have different the way, effects. But the yeah. fact that I will be able to concentrate whether or not I have ADHD, I will be able to concentrate more on mm-hmm. an amphetamine. Of course you will. That's why people like methamphetamines. They work. I think part of that problem, too, just to like kind of face point is you're kind of taking someone that maybe at baseline has kind of this disorganized brain chemistry and you're bringing them to normal. Mm -hmm. You as a human. okay, you go on this medication, you start to feel normal. What is normal? If you have any kind of deviation from what you've been living at, you're going to think you've reached, quote unquote, normal. So to Jeff's point, like, yeah, people are always going to have like. To, uh, to situations a lot of degree. where like they're always yeah they're always going to get some change but to face point like it's hard to tell whether that change is to what your normal state should be or if that change is now past normal and still focusing mm-hmm. so yeah this, the, is a pod, this is an audio medium but yeah. if you see yeah. my hands <laughs> i think that, i mean like all things the problem with in uh, disease when we're talking about health and disease is we need a clear delineation of like this is pathological and this is not in other words this is causing a problem in your life and this is not right but it is always going to be a spectrum for any disease no matter what it is whether it's arthritis right there's going to be a point where arthritis becomes pathological and that it is causing you problems in your life it but where that line is it you might have had it for five six years before you noticed that it was so bad that it was now pathological Um, and so we didn't diagnose it as arthritis before then the same thing with uh, mental health diagnoses that it's always going to be a spectrum and where you fall on that is going to be kind of different for every person. And then trying to figure out what equals normal, what equals able to function in society. That's also going to be different for every person. And yet we try to have these kind of binary um, definitions so that we can survive, right? We need to categorize things so that we can figure out how to navigate the world. That's just how we work. So here's a wrinkle for the mental health professionals out there. I would say there are a couple buckets of people. One bucket would love to have kind of a defined I have ADHD, I have anxiety, I have depression. They want that, like, I have this. It is clinically diagnosed or to whatever degree diagnosed. They want to, like, feel as though they have that identity. There's another bucket of people that might be more okay in the wishy-washy, like, I have ADHD tendencies, I have neurodivergent tendencies, I have anxious tendencies. But, like, how do you figure out which bucket those people are in? I think that's a challenge. Also, for some people, it, as you kind of implied when you said that, it's a bad it's bad news if they don't if they aren't able to get that diagnosis if they're yes. not if the clinical presentation is not strong enough to yeah. qualify. Like, as a, I want to uh, reframe that a little bit because do. I don't think that it's they're they want a diagnosis like in the sense that they want there to be something that is abnormal. It's that they want an explanation for the things that they are feeling. Sure, yeah. And in the way and I, and that, that's yeah. what I, yeah, that, thank you. Well, well said. Because it's not, 
which is why I think that these videos get so popular and why they get like such a broad audience and why they're written kind of like horoscopy is clickbaity horoscopy yeah, etc is because when you get a group of people who are looking for an explanation of why they do something of like oh I'm stubborn because I was born in early May like so I'm a tourist like that kind of thing like so, you want an explanation second for Second child, first child thing. Which yeah, is, like uh, we want these categories to figure out why we are the way that we are because what is our brain doing like in this meat sack of a body that we have? Like why is it doing these things? Yeah. So we seek out these explanations and we seek out these groups of people who are like us that have similar Hogwarts houses or similar like Myers-Briggs personality types. And we want that because it makes, it attaches like, reasoning and belonging to it belonging like, it's not the key for me yeah, yeah it's not just my brain it's not just the way that this is a valid thought process it's, it's the way other people are doing things it's got a word it's got a name it's got ways to help it and i think that's what people are seeking out more so i think saying that people are seeking out a diagnosis comes with like some pretty icky connotations sure where i think most people are seeking like that sense of community. And that's where it kind of falls in those, like the connection between those two buckets is they so, just want, why am I doing this? So if that's the case mm -hmm. and a patient approaches you who says, I'm worried that I might have this. And it seems to you that they are very interested in not necessarily being diagnosed with something pathological, but, but getting that explanation. And you're not, able, not quite able to provide them with that or to the extent that they might want. What would you, how would you approach that? You know, whether they're like clinically diagnosed with something or not, if they're coming to you, it's something that's really bothering them and that they need tools with helping with. And if you're the kind of physician who has those tools, then you can give them that, whether they have a diagnosis or not, or hopefully point them to someone who right. can give them those tools. Right. I think- Ain't nothing wrong with, you know, for instance, for some of these, ain't nothing wrong with, you know, therapy for trying to figure out, like, what it is you can... This is a strongly pro-therapy podcast. Yeah. Yeah. cannot <laughs> yeah. emphasize that enough. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, uh, I'm going to use a, a physical ailment as a corollary here. Just to kind of take off the emotional charge. If somebody comes in and they say, doctor, I, I think I might have asthma. And you do the tests and it turns out they don't have asthma. They just have a harder time breathing when they're riding their bike than they used to. That's a conversation that you can have about, you know, <clears throat> how do we increase our lung capacity? How do we make sure that we're exercising in proper conditions, right? Like obviously uh, most of us are having a hard time riding our bike when it's like 30 degrees outside, right? Or when there's a wildfire. Or yeah, for example. <laughs> and the, these are conversations you have that doesn't necessarily mean that their condition is pathological, but it does mean that there are tools that we can give them to help live the life that they want to live because they're looking for meaning. I will reiterate probably one of the most significant things that a mental health professional has ever told me. I was being tested for various things. Who knows? And he said, he, we are meaning making machines. We love to find meaning in everything around us. And sometimes that's useful. And sometimes that's not. My example was depression where it's always like, I'm depressed because X thing or that thing. Right. And his, the advice that he was trying to give me was sit down and think, it, are any of those things really that different from they were yesterday? If the answer is no, then it could just be you have a bad, bad brain chemistry day, right? And there's no actual meaning to it. It's just this, right? But that could work in, in other ways too. Like there doesn't always have to be a meaning to it or a reason to it. Sometimes we're just kind of on some semblance of not what we want to be. And that's okay too. Short Coats, if this episode is worth listening to this far, it's worth sharing. So blast us on your socials. And if you want a sticker for your trouble, send us a screenshot. Thanks. What could be so difficult is in medicine, as we talk a lot about in this podcast, like there are some areas of problem, I would call it. And for example, like sleep apnea, another kind of like physical ailment that has this similar like corollary in that if you want to be diagnosed with sleep apnea, you have to go and do the sleep test and you have to have so many events of hypoxia like you have to literally have like five events or whatever kind of arbitrary right. somebody has come up with a somebody very has defined come up with a binary right. we need a line we need a line yeah. but if you go into that sleep study and they say 
sorry, you only had four of these events. That doesn't mean that you don't have some sort of sleep disturbance. Mm -hmm. Like if you're literally just below the cutoff line, like you might still very much be having a hard time sleeping. And to kind of face point, like people just want meaning. They want to feel Mm -hmm. heard. They want to feel as though they have some explanation for a thing that they know is going on. And basically, they just don't want to be gaslit by like the (laughs) medical community for thinking that like you're insane. No, like you're still having sleep disturbances. Let's try to figure this out. But the problem is we don't have the time to kind Mm -hmm. of go down that route. But I think what is hard is we live in a lot of ways. Medicine is very binary. Like you have it or you don't. But like almost everything is more on a spectrum. You have a little bit of it or you have a lot of it. And I think mental health is similar. I think we have these buckets of symptoms and quirks that people have to some degree. And just because you don't reach the DSM's diagnosis for ADHD, it doesn't mean that you don't have quirks that mm. still would be, I don't know. I think that, treated. I think Benefited, the thing yeah. that I sometimes think about with these issues is, is that, and, and maybe this ties into the whole, you know, social media video thing about these traits that you may or may not have is in order to get an actual diagnosis, you probably have to go through some arduous process that it will long. determine you know, whether or not that's true or not. And so it's a lot easier to self-diagnose, which mm-hmm. I think is one of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of you know, when I said, I feel like I have these traits myself and you know, maybe I've Social over- media is the modern overcome Google them, doctor. But I'm not really all that interested in going through the tests that might determine whether or not that's actually true or not. I may come to regret this in future years if my uh, systems fall apart, but I guess I'll deal with it at, at, at that time. I think um, it, it comes down to, to risk reward, right? So like if you're going through all of these hoops to get this diagnosis, a lot of the times it's because you genuinely feel like something can be improved, right? right? So for example, I recently made a TikTok about this. My Uh, father passed away from uh, cerebral aneurysm there's a pretty strong genetic component to those right i don't feel like there's a lot of value to me going to get screened at this point in my life right and so i haven't jumped through all of those hoops to get that potential diagnosis because it wouldn't change much but if i'm struggling with adhd and i'm a medical student and this is you know my entire life is on the line my ability to manage this chronic condition I might be more apt to jump through some hoops because I know that there are solutions that can help me. And I think that's appropriate. Okay. And I think one big part of that, especially in the realm of like ADHD and ASD and like the neurodivergence aspect to it is that is absolutely lovely. It is missing a conversation about the barriers to care, especially with those conditions that there are many people in the world who would look at a late in life diagnosis of a woman with ADHD and say, no, that that is not factual. Like they could look at my neuropsych testing and say, like, no, that's not factual because people who have ADHD diagnoses and who get them are five year old little boys who can't sit still in class. Like that is who gets it. And until like there is a huge barrier to even getting a diagnosis that you have to get somebody you have to like luck into finding somebody that even believes that is something you can get like it's as an adult as a woman yeah yeah. because they we have a nasty little habit in medicine and research of trying it in one specific group and (laughs) saying everybody works like this yeah and that is not that doesn't the case at all and we could do you could start a whole separate podcast and you would never run out of material to talk about that. So I think as much as we want to say, okay, this didn't happen. These criteria aren't being met. That is incredibly important. And that is very clinically significant, but so is addressing and reflecting on what preconceived notions you have about this condition that maybe are why this person has not gotten a diagnosis, even though you feel they are like so close Mm. or like, are you looking at a different presentation? Like if you only evaluate someone for inattentive type ADHD, they could have 
hyperactive and like score, they wouldn't score clinically significantly. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist. Like, you don't quote me on that, but there's two different presentations and there's combined type and these two distinct ones on their own. And so figuring out that you assume that this person who's having trouble focusing has inattentive type when in reality their brain's running like a million miles an hour in a different direction. Maybe like it's, yeah, as much as it is figuring out why that person wants the thing that they are seeking, it's just as important to figure out why, what barriers are maybe getting in the way of them achieving that. Not in them achieving a diagnosis, but just them achieving a sense of like greater understanding. I'm going to give you the last word on that because I need to move on to the next thing. <laughs> Do you mind if I, you can not put it in a different order. You can even cut it out. I just, <laughs> I have something that I feel compelled to add. All right. To add just, we know that you have this. It's, it's a serious problem. My wife <laughs> Go ahead. Time for it. Um, to add just a little bit of a nuance and maybe a small defense of the medical establishment as it currently is. The DSM-5 is significantly different than the DSM-4. This is the book of all medical or like clinical psychological diagnoses, right? And the same is true for every other field of medicine that our understanding continues to evolve and our ability to make smaller, more useful boxes to put people in to help them understand their conditions continues to improve. And um, human beings as a species struggle with functional fixedness. That is, the older we get, the harder it is for us to adapt to new ideas. And so there will, of course, be providers that are uncomfortable with a new way of looking at a diagnosis because they've looked at it a certain way for decades. That doesn't mean that that provider is completely useless to us. They can help us with a lot of things. They may not be the best person to go to for a new understanding. But also, every new understanding is still very much up for debate because we're trying to we have to debate it, right? We have to have conversations. Well, that's to how tease this works. Out, yeah. Yeah. What is actually going on, right? And that's true of any field of medicine, any pathology. There's going to be renegotiations of meaning and rene- renegotiations of what is actual pathological. And unfortunately for the patients, they have to live while we're still trying to figure things out. Um, so good luck out there. And they have to advocate for change to a lot of that burden for increasing sort of the range of people who can be diagnosed is on the patients who aren't meeting the threshold that should change. An upcoming trial for a vaccine is aimed at blocking the effects of fentanyl and heroin to prevent lethal overdoses. Uh, The vaccine could significantly combat addiction by preventing those drugs from crossing the blood-brain barrier, which would obviously eliminate the high that you would get from these drugs. The vaccine works by generating an antibody response against um, the opiates in question. Uh, when they bind to the drugs in the bloodstream, they prevent the drugs from crossing the blood brain barrier. It could be a powerful tool, right? For somebody who is seeking treatment for a fentanyl addiction. Um, it's the, From what I'm reading, it's very specific to fentanyl and its analogs, but it doesn't interfere with medications like naloxone that are used in to reverse overdoses. So clinical trials are set to begin with phase one, which is, remind me, that's like. Usually healthy people. So it'd be like non, people that are non addicted to Mm -hmm. fentanyl, I would assume. It's just making sure it's not hurting people. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lengthy process ahead to, to figure out whether it can actually be used or not. My question, is it worth it? I mean, for instance, one of the arguments against this that I read about was that there is, there are medical uses of fentanyl, especially in anesthesiology, right? So that's one problem. And the other problem is, you know, if you're vaccinated against the effects of fentanyl in this way, you know, maybe they, maybe people will seek out other drugs that might give them the effect that they're looking for. So leaving aside the moment for, leaving aside for the moment, the potential to encourage seeking out other drugs I guess I speculate that the number of people with opiate use disorders probably outweighs the number of people who might in the future need fentanyl as anesthesia in surgery. But is that, do you think that's true? I don't. And, and aren't there alternatives? Yeah, I don't know if it is necessary that necessarily that they would be outnumbering them. I 
these, this is a Venn diagram. These aren't concentric circles, yeah. right? Yeah. So there will be plenty of people that don't feel the need for this vaccine and they will still get fentanyl and, and anesthesia and those that have that. There are already anesthetics, for example, that cause allergic reactions. We avoid them and we use other ones, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't really see much of a difference in and, this and, case. And these people who get treated with this, I mean, it's not like everybody, it's not like, you know, a smallpox vaccine. Yeah. Where a vast majority of people would get it. This is probably best used for people who want to be treated for this problem. So I just wasn't really sure, like, about this objection. Um, it sounds super cool, like on the surface. I think it seems like it could really revolutionize the treatment of substance use disorder. I am curious, though. And again, this is a corollary that is in no way like near the degree of kind of fentanyl addiction. But as a person who has tried to like block her social media addiction at times, like I have found Ooh. ways around it. Like I have blocked myself and then I will just like figure out a different <laughs> way around it and I will still end up on social media. I've done this, too. this is my cross to bear. Delete, it the is app. My Delete the app if you want, but you know, there's know. always the web. You can always get it back. And so again, I'm not saying that wouldn't I'm I think it begs the question of like who is the perfect group that would then be getting this vaccination, like that it would truly be effective. And it's not so it sounds like it would last I, I a think while. The issue is that most people that are having overdoses with fentanyl are not attempting to use fentanyl. They're attempting to use aware. heroin or cannabis or some other drug that fentanyl has been added to. Yeah. So anybody that uses recreational drugs that is bought not from a dispensary uh, would benefit from this. That's a great point. Yeah, I like that one. Because it was, it seems like, and I don't, I didn't read the article, I'm sorry, but it seems like if it's, if it's got the specificity that we're looking for, it's only going to interfere with fentanyl and then somebody then can go use some other opiate and, you know, not die of a fentanyl overdose, mm -hmm. which would be on the whole nice. I can certainly see the argument. I had this debate in my head about a lot of issues, I'm less emotionally charged about this one personally, but we have finite resources in the world. That's just the nature of living on a planet with finite resources. I can certainly understand how somebody might complain that we're putting effort into this as opposed to some other condition that we could work on, say neglected tropical diseases or something like that. Mm. And it's certainly more of an issue with people that think that substance addiction is like their own fault kind of thing sure. which like it's in the dsm and there's a reason that it's in the dsm like this is something that we study right but at the same time i, I can understand that is an argument that will be made that these resources should probably have gone to i don't know childhood leukemia something that they didn't choose to partake in but at the end of the day lives not lost is a good thing whatever the condition or you're like, whatever you, you consider to be like a good person or whatever, I want people alive. And uh, if this stops people from dying, I think that it would be a, a worthwhile endeavor. I think it's going to require a lot of buy-in and education by the medical community. I think when I hear about this, I think a lot about the podcast, the retrievals, which is about women at a fertility, a fertility clinic, who were given saline instead of fentanyl, yeah. but their medical professionals just assumed that maybe they were addicts, maybe they just like were immune to fentanyl's effects and didn't really listen to their pain and try to prescribe them some other sort of anesthesia and just let them suffer. So I think we have to be really careful about that, especially if a lot of people are getting this vaccine, anesthesia needs to be very thoughtful for their care. It's a good point because it's already hard to get treatment for for drug addiction, uh, drug addictions anyway. For some reason, it's under prescribed is my impression, these treatments. So the nice thing about something like this is that it's kind of it's a silver bullet for a problem. Yeah, maybe a one and done kind of thing. Yeah. And we are enamored in medicine with silver bullets since penicillin. We have loved the idea of one thing solving this healthcare problem, right? Yeah. And in the sense of dealing with fentanyl overdoses, this is that one thing that solves the problem. If it works as well as we would hope it to work, yeah. right? I mean, if it comes out and turns out it doesn't work at all, then, you know, moot point, but. The theory behind it is a step in a great direction, like kind of how some of the stuff that you had touched on that we commonly see pain or use disorders as like, they need to get stronger. They need to like have more willpower. They need to like 
pull themselves up by their bootstraps and like just fix themselves. But like addressing a psychological or a social issue, which is how we commonly classify like substance use disorders with something that is so medical and so something that we don't use for anything else. Like we are not giving vaccines for anxiety and depression. Like we other things that we would consider more like psychological or social as compared to like things that we say are 100 percent medical like diabetes like reframing that and addressing it with a wholly medical solution brings it more into the realm of like this is a medical problem like this is a physiological problem and not just weakness and laziness and you being an intrinsically bad person needs a paradigm shift is what you're talking about you know we need to to amoralize medicine yeah um there doesn't need to be any conversation about whether something is right or wrong it is a pathology it is health you're not you're not a bad person because you have smallpox you're also not a bad person if you have substance uh, addiction it just is something that you're struggling with and we can address it And just because you get the fentanyl vaccine, you might not even be addicted to any drugs. You might not even use drugs. So just sort of like a blind respect for people who choose to get this vaccine for whatever reason it is. Well, we'll see how that comes out, I guess, in the future. I'm imagining a lot of moms sending their kids off to college and saying, like, nope, you're getting it just in case. I think it's going to be a weird sort of a weird thought process because I think a lot of people who are really concerned about fentanyl based on a lot of maybe conspiracy things might also be the people who don't really like vaccines and think that they're not safe. To your point about moms, you know, getting, having their kids get vaccines. I think most people don't really think that way. I think, you know, you send your kid off to college and you're not, most parents aren't thinking, boy, there's a real strong chance that they're going to experience fentanyl. (laughs) Or they're gonna, you know, they're gonna come into contact with fentanyl. So I'm gonna get them this vaccine. Well, I just but it's the, the same moms as that are afraid with like, it, it, I mean, because it is often laced in cannabis, right? And th- there's an advocacy group in California. It's moms whose children have died, and they, they won't even use the word overdose. It's a poisoning to them because they weren't trying to get fentanyl. They yeah. were, they were using some other substance, right? So it, I can imagine that there are moms out there who are aware of the issue from that side and just concerned enough, right? Yeah. It's like I, the moms that send their kids to college with a, a thousand condom, condoms. They're like, just be safe. Well, I just imagine it'll have the same uphill battle as far as vaccines go to compared to like Gardasil and the HPV mm-hmm. vaccine. Mm-hmm. And I think we, I mean, I think our generation was the first one that like got it when we were pretty young. But I'm from what I remember, like it was an uphill battle. Like, yeah, there were you, people who would have seen an HPV infection as a sign of... A sign of impurity or whatever it is because we still live in a puritanical society and whatnot. But... Is it it, like 70% of adults in the U.S. have HPV? Yeah, it's like a crazy amount. So it's like most people... (laughs) Impurity. I'm just going to go around and be like, you don't have HPV? Impure! Impure! (laughs) That you wanted to vaccinate your like 14-year-old daughter against it as like, oh, so you think that like... They're a slut. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. See, I didn't know what words I could say, but yeah, like you're. you're maybe we. Maybe uh, I'll find out. We can't say that. I, don't know. I like the word floozy. 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 Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it had that same uphill battle, which is basically like you're kind of, you have to get past that barrier of like, oh, my child may in some world be exposed to HPV. Most likely in this world could be exposed to HPV because we know seventy percent of adults have it, and so on and so forth. So. With the same frame of thought, you have to look at your, I don't know, let's call it a 12 year old. I don't know when the vaccine would be administered to look at that child that you've raised and be like, my child might do drugs someday. And for a lot of parents, they'd be like, yeah, that's likely because like maybe I did. Yeah. (laughs) But like for a separate subset of parents, they cannot fathom. That would be a life ruiner. So it'll have that same challenging road to get past. But there will be a lot of people that I will say as a parent who of a seven year old who I would very much like for him to get through his teenage years without experiencing HPV <laughs> or fentanyl as a teenager who did not indulge in alcohol or drugs or anything like that. It was a boring stick in the mud, I guess, and hoping that my child is the same. Yeah, he's still going to get <laughs> the HPV vaccine. And if this was a thing and we were in high school, yeah, why not? 
Uh, you're, even, a, you're a cool parent. I yeah. just I think there's another subset of parents. I don't want my child to have to pay the price that high, steep of a price for a mistake. Yeah. If, if they're like, Dad, I was at a party and I wanted to try it and yeah. then, he, then he dies. Like, no, that's not. We're not doing that. Yeah. So I'd rather just come home and be like, I, I hated it or I loved it or whatever. I don't care. You know? Yeah. And I think that's where the fear mongering like comes in of like the narrative gets changed of it's not it's no longer like sweet little Timmy that you've like known since they were seconds old, like wants to go do drugs. It then becomes this like the bad people are out to get your kid and they're going to drug your kid and it's going to be like a whole then it becomes. Unfortunately, we live in a time where medicine is heavily politicized and it's become kind of a weapon of that and i think vaccines we can all agree are a big they're a big <laughs> part situation of yeah that issue itself yeah. and yeah. i don't see this one being any different it, any and it's better. been fun to see that issue kind of punted around the political spectrum over my lifetime but i mean even we're going into halloween season my entire life people have been concerned about check your kids halloween candy yeah, for, for drugs I'm razor like, blades razors. yeah <laughs> like Who's putting razor blades in your Twitter? So that's it's based on a real story, and it was the parent of the child. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a stranger. Yeah. And no, uh, the public service announcement for any parent that might be listening: nobody likes your kids enough to give them drugs. Drugs Mm -hmm. are expensive. They want them for themselves. (laughs) The Dare program lied to all of us. No one is out giving free drugs away to everybody. Like Mm -hmm. very rarely in my entire life. I'm now 30 years old, and maybe I just don't have cool friends. But like almost never in my entire life has somebody said, come on, do the drugs. Yeah, you're more likely to, <laughs> as you said before, you're more likely to come into accidental contact. Yeah. Uh, like that daycare in, I think, was it New York, where they discovered that it was basically a front for a drug operation and kid died. Well, that's really or sad. it's, it's yeah. very dangerous for like nurses and first responders, too, for people yeah. who are experiencing an overdose. Yeah. Because of like the skin mm-hmm. contact. Oh, then we should go ahead and just nix this one so the powder does not get in through the skin that is a common um, belief and a lot of well and first responders that are non-medical that's not a thing you will not get fentanyl overdose by putting it in your palm and rubbing it around that's just not out of curiosity could it go through a cut i'm literally just curious (laughs) to my knowledge no okay like it has to because of i'm thinking of like bloodborne pathogens yeah Yeah. but maybe not it, it, it is possible i don't necessarily know exactly how it's metabolized but i know that it will not go through your skin shout out skin yeah. yeah it's doing a lot it, it's, but like even if it's not like the scientific fact it's a real fear that people have it that keeps fear, yeah. them from treating yeah. people who are in real need of help yeah well you made it to the second break you tolerate us if you can consider donating or buying a sticker or something visit the shortcoat.com and help us do stuff without having to beg a dean for money thanks should we play a game before we finish this up? Yeah, let's let's liven things up around here. All right. It's always a good idea to practice your professional skills. And you know me. I want to give you that opportunity. Faith, uh, Faith. I just. Faith, I promise you don't have to eat not, anything. I'm just not going to make a judgy face and I'm going to look away so you can't see you, when I you, do it. You do have a habit of trying our trust. Right yes. Though, but that's okay. I, I still love specifically. you. Specifically. <laughs> this should be fine. <laughs> That's what she said the last time. Among the most important ways that you'll communicate with patients is when the news isn't great. One of you in this game will be the doctor and one will be the patient. The doc will draw a fictional condition or disease from the cup and then enter the exam room to break the bad news and discuss possible treatments. The patient has their own cup to draw from and for each of these. And, you know, so it's an improv challenge. Makes people a little nervous. But you can do it. We're all improving every single day of our lives. Right. The, these, this is just an these additional are light-hearted things. Yes. These are light-hearted skills. things, and like we're not doing group. actual. Elective. Yeah, you don't have like metastatic no. lung cancer. No, okay. I'm not that much. I mean, of an, that, I'm not that much of an. Have idea. any yeah. of you guys gotten to the point where you do have to go through the like simulated patient where you deliver bad news? Yeah, yeah. No, that was it. Felt real. <laughs> I was yeah. like, ours was over Zoom though, so maybe. Oh, mine was <laughs> crying. Yeah, real tears. I was like, bravo! Like mm-hmm. great those acting. SPs are good. Those the, SPs are great. When you get to the emotional patient one, I'm going to give you the warning that I wish I had. They're coming in guns blazing. Yeah. They are. <laughs> they're there is they're no, vying for the Oscar. They, like, <laughs> if it's, if there's like an upset one and a sad one, and like you're told this going into it, the sad one like is heartfelt and like tear jerkery. 
if you have a problem with like adults yelling at you, maybe don't volunteer to be a part of like the yelling you have a one, choice? the angry one. We were, oh, okay. but like that was what our small group facilitator did. Okay. So he was like, do you want to do the sad one or the angry one? And we had a stereotypical group of three women and three men who self divided across gender lines. And the men said, we don't want the crying lady. Like okay. we'll get yelled at. And he came in and he yelled. And okay. Jim is a very nice man, but he really scared me that day. <laughs> well, let's try this. Yeah. So, so this is an improv challenge. Doctor? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. What was that? Riley's going to be my doctor. Okay. And I'm going to be a patient. Improv challenge. Have a conversation. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. The two cups are there on the, <clears throat> on the table. Pick your. Thank you kindly. Okay. I've always wanted to be a patient, but I keep forgetting to go to the doctor. So yeah, this is exciting. No problem. This counts. No. <laughs> no the, the people who are only listening to audio here are I'm really like missing out on some like Can I just surprising one? facial expressions I've got going on. <laughs> All right, begin. Hi, Jeff. So how was the weather out there today? <laughs> I'm going like back to my... <laughs> How'd you get here today? It's like terrible. Doctor. Bright and balmy. Tra traffic. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Coffee. Bright and balmy. Bright and balmy. Well, I'm glad to hear. At least it's warming up a little bit. Before we get into what we're here to talk about today, I just want to ask: Do you do you have anyone here that you'd love to to kind of join you in the room as we chat a little bit about what you're here to see me for? Oh, I brought my good friend with me today. Awesome. And what is your good friend's name? Sarah. Sarah, I it's nice your to name. meet I'm so you. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sarah now. Hi, Sarah. It's nice to meet you. So. Jeff, what do you think that you're here to discuss today? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I've got, I got some thoughts, but I, I really wanted to hear your thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So you're not aware of what you've been tested for? No, she's not. No. I know, but I was going to try to kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> he just goes for it. Okay. Well, Jeff and Sarah, so we went through your test results and we saw something a little puzzling. Puzzling. Oh, no. And we... Doctor, I must say real quick, you <laughs> have a phenomenal vocabulary. You should consider monetizing that. Thank you. Okay, go on. So it's quite puzzling, your results, because we found evidence of dermis puzzletum. It's puzzling in many ways. Um, I see. Which means that you unfortunately have jigsaw skin. I've always suspected what has made you suspect? Well, my skin kind of looks like a jigsaw puzzle. Do you ever find that like parts of your skin come off in chunks and you can like rearrange them? But yeah. It like, like doesn't fit quite right. Yeah. Okay. You were yeah. doing that the other day. Yeah. 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 It was actually family game night. Okay. Um, okay. And has that. Awkward. <laughs> uh, we've actually thought about like, you know, it could be like a, a pretty successful puzzle business yeah we were, we're sort of about. worried though because we're like i don't know if everyone does this you yeah know? yeah so these results they may not be ready kind uh -huh. of like i said can be challenging to hear how yeah. how do you feel having heard about um oh i, I just I, I feel heard and validated in our puzzling endeavor i guess i just want to make sure that it's not like a problem like is this gonna how is this going to affect my life you know is this gonna prevent me from being the successful hustler that i was meant to be you know you know that's a great question what kind of hustling do you like to do the Mostly, side kind yeah. well you know what i think this might actually make your life better yeah because if you're a side hustler and you're looking for that passive income that everyone's looking for you've got puzzled skin i do you can sell that <laughs> you know what you know what i'm thinking subscriptions yeah because you're a doctor i want to know what you think about this because you're the doctor and you're the medical expert i want to make sure that this is something that is 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 healthy I'm thinking maybe i could get tattoos you know you could pick them out you can design them and then when the skin comes off then we've got an actual puzzle mm -hmm. and then we could sell that i think you know? that that is a great point they do sell that adhesive on amazon where you yeah. can like glue it back together yeah. and then display it in your house yeah i so, think that's yeah I think you have a great attitude toward this. It is incurable, but that's okay because it I, turns out it's actually going to be a pretty successful it's business here. Be a I think, really yeah, successful business. Yeah. So it's it's mildly painful, but like the 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 thrill of putting the puzzle together at the end is so worth it. Don't you that think? That dopamine. Yeah. Yeah. Should be should we be worried about like transmission of any like you know 
viruses or diseases through these yeah i mean she helps them put pieces. the puzzles back together i mean, yeah. i want to make sure that she's safe you know yeah no that's that's a great point well you actually have two layers of skin so you've got the puzzle layer and then the under layer so you're fine as far oh, as good. awesome goes. Good, wonderful good, good. Yeah. yeah no worries yeah. unless you guys are yeah. really dirty just gonna just have to make sure that you know we <laughs> clean it first and uh put like you know no children under age of five on the box like yeah exactly you know, don't want to eat those pieces um, oh, well done. Oh, thank you, doctor. Yeah, well done. You 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 came to an understanding there yeah, of the problem. I think it just, out yeah, great. yeah. I worry about you know what happens when you lose the when puzzle you lose piece. The piece. Yeah, oh. inevitably. Or you sell skin it skin in some space. weird yeah. black market skin. <laughs> That's what formaldehyde's for. Am, just just Amazon it. faith. No. Amazon. Amazon. Capitalism. Like, we're faith. on two different passive income websites. <laughs> <laughs> side hustler yeah. understandable yeah. when i said your results are puzzling i <laughs> internally was I had excited. Excited. well let's try faith and, and jacqueline then. or you sarah as she's now known sarah would I'll you like to be you, the doctor you could be a doctor or sarah patient. <laughs> sarah jacqueline i will be your friend <laughs> attending your medical yeah. appointment with you since you Who's went the doctor i'll be the medical time. student joining you in the room oh today, i love that <laughs> where i stand there and i'm just like Says nothing. <laughs> says nothing. <laughs> Contributes nothing. It's always a bummer when the doctor doesn't introduce you and you're like, I need uh, my <laughs> dill. We're starting. Okay, I'm good. Pretend I'm not here. I'm good. I'm not here. So. Oh, she's going through all of them. I'm her? trying to have a good ending for you. The <laughs> I think that man. depends on what mine is. That's just hard to say. Like, I had to think D- about it. Dig through the cup. No, I, I, li- no, I like this one. <laughs> I feel like I really wanted to be diagnosed with enigmaticness because oh, is this I tend to try to be a mysterious man yeah. everywhere I go. Okay, well, Jeff oh, ruined that one. So. <laughs> I tend to ruin things. It's part of my enigma. Hello. Hello. How'd you get in today? A this door. is it's the it's, No, it's yeah. like how was getting in? Like did you have a okay. how was parking? It's Sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to this is how every single one of these starts. Is it's always how is parking? How is just for the any listeners mm-hmm. out there who are planning on going into medicine? Don't ask your patients how was parking. It was terrible. It, it was, was at a terrible. hospital. Mm-hmm. It was they're five miles away. They're paying they twenty hated bucks. It. Don't talk to them about. Usually, parking. I just ask how are you, and it's normally fine because if they're feeling bad, they're always just gonna be like, I feel like crap, and then I'm like, awesome. Tell Let's me about, about that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we didn't. We, we were interrupting their <laughs> flow. I mean, sorry, doctor. Yeah, you know, there was light traffic, so I yeah. got here pretty easily. There always is. It's unavoidable. But I'm glad you're able to get in and we were able to have this appointment today. Did Do you have any idea of kind of what we're going to be talking about today or what any possible results might be? I've just had these like weird things going on. And so hopefully you have like mm-hmm. an ex- explanation for me. Yeah, so ultimately what we ended up figuring out was with the help of our lovely medical student. Hi, my name's Riley. It's yeah. So you've already previously <laughs> consented to this our medical exactly student being in, in the room. Life. It's We've done this already. Unfortunately, you do have digitus invisibilis, Alex, or just an invisible big toe, as you could say. So I think that's it's what we've determined is kind of the cause of some of those balance issues and your shoe's not fitting right and it's... That's ultimately what we've been able to piece together. Is that... Did Tyson's Foods tell you to say that? What relationship do you have with Tyson's Foods? I just, you know, I looked at some of your funding coming in. And I saw where it was coming from. And I, you know, I'm not sure to believe you or not. Because it seems like you're sort of, you know, being controlled by big farming. Okay, well, we do get some lunches catered by their (laughs) PR department. They do send us them. We have tried to not partake in them. They will send them anyway. So we do have to keep listing it on our financial disclosures form, but they get no say in medical decision making or even have any access to patient records of any kind. So they just, it's just them sending us the chicken nuggets. I bet she's going to prescribe chicken nuggets for your condition. Yeah. That's really convenient of you to say that. I don't think don't actually. chicken nuggets would necessarily help in this situation. If it's something you're interested in or wanting to avoid, we can certainly discuss that more and make sure to note it in your chart. But at least for our plan of care right now, I do not foresee chicken nuggets needing to be a part of it if it 
is that if that's all right with you yeah and no like animal products no like vaccines because i just don't want to be i don't want the chip that they put in you when they give you the like the egg vaccines that they got from big farming i don't want that i don't need you know corporate farming to have my like health data okay well we absolutely will not be giving your health data to anyone that isn't listed on those forms that the nice people at the front desk had you fill out so we will double check that and we'll make sure to get that noted in your chart to make sure all of your preferences are very clear and that we are abiding by those um and so if you list them down we will call and confirm but we will not be sending your health information to anyone that you don't want it to go to or giving you any egg vaccines that'll be something that even if it any vaccines will be discussed later this is just about your invisible big toe which is unrelated to eggs of any kind (laughs) okay do you have any other questions or concerns i guess more specifically related to your invisible big toe and we can kind of address some of the other yeah is is there any any cure for this for an invisible big toe ultimately there is not it's just something that you maybe need to buy a shoe size bigger and size up a little bit but it's there whether or not you can see it but there's we can't we couldn't do surgery because they would have to be able to see it to do surgery Mm. okay yeah i feel like i can handle that it's it's nice to know you know what's going on i don't know i just the, the chicken the chicken nuggets that you get from the big farms are really hard for me to get over but I think I'll be okay. Well, we really appreciate you working with us and letting us know that feedback. Our med student's actually going to look up everything about chicken nuggets and do a presentation tomorrow that I'm definitely (laughs) going to remember to have them do. I'm going to spend six hours on it tonight. Yeah. I'm (laughs) I'm not going to bring it up at all tomorrow. And and, and I'm not even going to present it tomorrow. Um, I'll present it like a month later when they were. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming in today and for letting us know your concerns about the group that you get healthcare from. We definitely appreciate that and we hope you have a great rest of your day. No, oh, thank you, doctor. Uh, what I like about this interaction is you went with it. Yeah. I mean, this could come up. This is the sort of thing, not, not big farming in particular, <laughs> yeah, but you know, this could come <laughs> up and you were like, absolutely. Your concerns are legitimate and we're going to do our best to take note of them. God love you. I'm from Indiana. Oh, big farming. Oh, big farming. Yeah. 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 The chickens control everything in Indiana, I'm, I'm told. Yeah. It might be preferable. <laughs> well done to both groups. That's our show. Jeff, Faith, Jacqueline, Riley, thanks for being on the show with me today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. And what kind of idiot would I be if I didn't thank you, Shortcuts, for making us a part of your week? If you're new here and you like what you heard today, follow us wherever fine podcasts are available. Um, or even not find ones. I don't know how you feel about today's show. Maybe you let me know. Today's show is produced by me. The show is uh, made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Fox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Oh, wonderful chicken noise. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.